and Tyler, uh, I can go through the first few slides here um, before we go into your presentation here. So, um, we can go to the next slide. Uh, again, I want to welcome everyone and thank you all for joining today's webinar. Oh, Tyler, you can uh, help. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Appreciate that. Uh, from submission to court, the basic of forensic biology laboratory. My name is William Moore with OJJDP's Intech. And before we get started today, I want to go over a few housekeeping items to keep in mind for today's webinar. Please note that this event is being recorded and the event will be uh, published on Intact's YouTube page and also on Zero Abuse uh, page at um, request. Go to the next slide. If you'd like to get access to archived presentations and webinars that we have, uh, you can simply go to the page and click through our multitude of uh, webinars that we have around juvenile justice and child victimization prevention related topics. If you'd like to get any access to supporting materials related to those webinars that you see, you can uh, reach out to the TTA help desk at this information and we can get you those supporting materials. Next slide, please. If you're having trouble downloading any of the event materials, again, like I mentioned earlier, please be sure to reach out to the uh, OJJDP TTA help desk where we can easily get you access to those items uh, and those materials related to today's webinar. If you'd like to have the most optimal audio, we encourage to have the WebEx system dial your phone and connect to the system. This will allow for you to have the most optimal experience uh, when viewing today's webinar. If anyone is experiencing any technical related difficulties, please send me, uh, the host, a private direct message and I can surely help to address any uh, tech issues that you may be having. Next slide. All right. Uh, during today's web event, our presenter will indeed be taking questions from the audience. We encourage you to go to the chat and type your questions there. When you're selecting the to button, who to send the question to, please be sure to select all panelists. I'll repeat that. Please be sure to select all panelists so that we can take an inventory of what questions are being submitted during today's web event. I'll have my uh, colleague and my co-host to post that uh, in about another maybe 30 minutes or so just as a reminder. But again, we want you to select all panelists so that we can collect the question that you're submitting for today's webinar. Once you select that, you hit enter and we will uh, receive your question and get to it during our Q&A. Next slide, please. All right, help us count. Now, uh, for those of you who are viewing in a group or you're uh, with additional people with you right now, we want to get a good count of how many are in the uh, room today or how many we have on today's webinar. If you could go to the chat room and type the total number of additional people in the room with you today. If you're viewing by yourself, there's no need to type anything at this time. However, if you're viewing with additional people, please type in the total number of additional people that are joining with you today. For example, if it's you and say your program manager or one of your colleagues that are joining you, you would put in plus one or plus two, et cetera, um, to let us know how many additional people are in the room with you today. You can send that in a private message to me or you can send it to all panelists. Next slide, please. All right, that being said, I will now turn today's presentation over to Tyler for our web event. Tyler, take it away. Thank you so much, William. Well, as William has alluded, my name is Tyler Council, and I'm the Director of Child Advocacy Studies, or CAST, which is a program designed to better prepare learners from higher education and beyond for recognizing and responding to child maltreatment when it develops in their professional lives through detection of abuse and neglect, or those at risk for variable forms of maltreatment that exist. I'm also a forensic scientist with almost a decade of lab experience. Forensics in our laboratory processes are incredibly important to your child maltreatment investigations and prosecutions. So I wanted to empower you all in attendance today with information regarding the basic pathway taken to process your biological evidence and the methods used to validate our test protocols so that you have a greater appreciation for the effort that goes into analyzing your samples for subsequent report dissemination and testimony in court. So with that, my contact information is here. 
This presentation then is provided today through Zero Abuse Project's Trauma Informed Prosecutor Project, which is supported through funding from the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention, an office of the U.S. Department of Justice and a component of the Office of Justice Programs. So today's overarching goal is to really help you better understand the fundamental route by which biological evidence progresses through your typical forensic laboratory. I also hope you'll become better knowledgeable of the and appreciate the level of care that goes into your evidence processing from basic item examination all the way down to facility composition itself so as to ensure that your evidence is processed free of potential contamination. We're also going to round out the conversation today by exploring how validation studies and quality standards ensure that not only the most rigorous methods and techniques are deployed for your testing needs, but that also we can be confident in the data that's delivered by an analyst and so that it cannot be easily combated by defense counter arguments that are centered around method validity and procedural robustness. Make note then, because we will be dialoguing about body fluid based evidence and crime scene elements. I want to warn you that you may see or hear about evidence in cases that could be traumatizing to some viewers. As such, practice self care as necessary. Let's go ahead and start by talking about the importance of this training for prosecutors and investigators. You know, there's been research performed that's tried to figure out why labs are sometimes in conflict with investigators and multidisciplinary team or MDT members that are submitting evidence to forensic laboratories. What we found from those studies is that oftentimes labs are understaffed, under resourced, and overworked, leading to potential backlog. Legally, many jurisdictions have laws outlining turnaround times that range anywhere from two to six months. To compensate for this legislation, since improvements to staffing and resources have not been significantly met, many crime labs limit the amount of cases they can process for a given unit and have caps on how many items per case can be analyzed via evidence tiers. In short, laws are demanding that crime analysts turn around evidence in lightning speed when everything from lab staffing, layout, procedure time, report evaluation, and proficiency testing investments simply aren't reflected realistically in policy pertaining to evidence processing. It demonstrates a lack of communication breakdown between the legislative and scientific arms of our justice system that then creates a disconnect between investigators and analysts as unrealistic turnaround expectations manifest as a result of poor governance and laboratory support. In fact, it's been demonstrated that a lack of robust and updated communication between district attorney's offices and the crime labs has actually led to confusion about evidence processing, turnaround timing, trial schedules, and delivery dates. The result is that you as prosecutors and investigators get frustrated and it's confusing to all parties intersecting the children we serve and those people we're trying to assist end up bearing the brunt of the disconnect in our system. Victims show up to court and it's ultimately delayed. Items don't get analyzed in time and sometimes not at all, which can result in a miscarriage of justice ultimately traumatizing that are those waiting for it. Does this sound familiar to any of you in attendance? Because prosecutors, investigators, and other MDT members are unaware of all the challenges to lab processing, and because we as lab personnel equally fail to make it clear alongside failing to recognize just how much quality control and quality assurance goes into handling even one item of evidence, we often get a proverbial butting of heads. You think we should get items completed and analyzed and results out in a week or less those items. We also have training and procedural or equipment validations that we have to go through, all of which can take time away from getting your results. In short, a lack of communication as to how a forensic lab overall functions, especially when it comes to biological evidence processing, has led to many heated moments where adjudicative and scientific arms of the system silo in and don't work well with one another. These poor relationships mean you may wind up not submitting to an agency. You could run into combative collaborations when trying to interpret results or get testimony from lab personnel, and it ultimately hurts the children in distress and the overall quality of your case. Simply put, when prosecutors and law enforcement officers don't understand lab workflow basics and all that goes into the samples that they end up disconnecting. Those poor working relationships lead to other fundamental misunderstandings or comprehension gaps where basically the right hand doesn't know what the left one is doing. For instance, a poor relationship between prosecutor and lab could lead to courtroom professionals avoiding testimony prep with analysts. Suddenly, the prosecutor misinterprets the likelihood ratio statistic during the trial and the analyst has to try and correct this deviation in court. The defense then uses this opportunity to invalidate that piece of evidence, that item, something easily avoided if we simply all got along and worked together as a team and understood the finer nuances of laboratory processing. Forensic interviewers, 
Likewise, should understand a bit about how crime labs work. From a study in the Journal of Interpersonal Violence, forensic interviewers and child advocacy center officials make up about half of the active membership in sexual assault response teams, or SARTs, in the U.S. And crime lab analysts aren't far behind. They actually make up almost a quarter of SART personnel. You see, crime lab analysts can work with forensic interviewers to prioritize what evidence should be collected that might give the most meaningful results as it pertains to, say, DNA or body fluid analysis. The analysts, too, can help with identifying possible contaminants based on details such as evidence location or dialogue indicating that attempts might have been made right to clean up or destroy key items. Thus, you should really understand what tests and measures your crime lab can and can't perform so you can work effectively to streamline and quickly identify evidence from a child's interview and disclosure. After all, the Office for Victims of Crime and their Sexual Assault Nurse Examiner Development Program and Operation Guide highlight that MDTs such as SARTs improve the response to sexual assault by creating positive relationships and collaborations among professional agencies and professionals. Thus, by knowing each other's duties and obligations, we know exactly what agency can and can't do. And so there's no role confusion or slowed responses since we're not all trying to figure out one another's jobs and stretch the duties of one organization over another, which would be to the detriment to those we serve and assist. Thus, if you know what I do or don't do in the lab, there's no role confusion. We can discuss the case overall and point out key elements each other may miss in our respective career paths. And children are then ultimately kept safe because we streamline our process based on each agency's known duties and responsibilities. My goal then today is to walk you through how a lab is set up to protect your evidence from my point of view as a biologist, given that DNA is one of the most prevalent items submitted for analysis. By understanding the workflow of your items and how a biology unit laboratory is set up to ensure high quality and low contamination results. I hope that you better recognize all that your analysts go through to get you key evidence with the best results possible to help those that you serve. Let's go ahead then and discuss the basic day to day in a forensic biology unit. You know, typically evidence involving the letting of biological stains requires serological testing of any suspect spot to determine if it is relevant to your case or not. After all, we wouldn't want to try and process a ketchup stain for DNA and waste valuable taxpayer dollars on false leads. To that end, I want to emphasize the importance of discretion in a lab analyst's work, especially right here at the beginning of the lifespan of an item of evidence in the lab, in serology, with an example. A small stain or a potentially dilute stain, one might simply not serologically examine. Now, why is that? Well, we could actually run the risk of using too much sample to determine if it's a body fluid and could thus prevent downstream DNA analysis if we consume the entire sample or take too much, leaving too little DNA behind for subsequent DNA analysis. Thus, some labs have caveats to their workflow, where certain types of stains, such as those that are too dilute or those that are very small, will be taken straight to DNA. After all, it's sometimes more important to know who a stain originated from versus knowing what type of body fluid is present and then never getting a DNA profile. As such, each sample goes through this discretionary evaluation by the analyst at the very beginning of its life at the laboratory. We have to determine what tests we can perform and may have to pick and choose the best testing for your items, even if it's not what you ideally wanted. Now, we don't just do this and simply steamroll over your lab requests. A good lab analyst is going to explain their rationale and defend it before they even commit to testing. But I present you with this example so that you understand that we may simply not be able to do everything you ask in the lab as it could be to the detriment of your case. Based on this example scenario, please recognize that discretion is perhaps the most important tool in our arsenal in the laboratory, and that we sometimes have to make tough choices on whether we can do any or perhaps only some of the tests you've requested for a given item. From a sample processing standpoint, there's usually two phases to serological, otherwise known as body fluid, testing in most cases. A presumptive test that helps us rapidly determine what a stain may or may not be, and then followed by a confirmatory test to shore up our results and ensure that what we are looking at is indeed a body fluid that warrants further analysis. Once we figure out the source of the stain and we arrive at the idea that it's a human stain relevant to your case, we have to go through an exhaustive process where we pull the DNA from the cells, see how much of it we're working with, create multiple copies of it to create a rich profile that we then have to review, clean up on a computer and statistically analyze to determine the probability of that person's DNA profile being contributed then by another random and unrelated person.
before we can determine what serological test that we need, we have to actually observe a potential stain on an item of evidence. At times, we can see stains with the unaided eye, but sometimes dilute stains or stains that are on non-contrasting backgrounds are pretty hard to see. So we use different wavelengths of light measured in nanometers via alternative light source or ALS devices. We scan the entire garment, the inside, the outside, front and back, in and out of each sleeve and pant leg and so on. It is quite a time consuming process, I'll be honest. There are expensive models of ALS that are benchtop or tabletop based and reach a, a wide array of spectra or different wavelengths of light, down to, believe it or not, portable torches that can be used on scene, they're handheld. Now, the following spectra of light that you see here in filters are just examples of the type of ALS wavelengths and filters or goggles that we'd use to detect the following body fluids. Note the body fluids are variable in terms of ALS detection. There's a wide range of filters and wavelengths that we can use. In fact, the landscape study on ALS from the Forensic Technology Center of Excellence is a fantastic resource, and this is provided in your handout in the slide notes that can help you determine the best ALS for your testing needs, and it really showcases the best wavelengths for a given state. As you can also determine, some ALS wavelengths of light do overlap. As such, ALS is a presumptive type of testing method and only used to screen for possible body fluids. Typically, blood would appear as a darker colored stain. Semen or saliva can be more light or what I would call a white fluorescent color in appearance. Note that fluorescent aids can also assist in body fluid detection as well. For instance, you can consider the use of Luminol, Blue Star, or other fluorescent sprays that bind to blood and cause them to light up under ultraviolet or UV light as screening methods for stains too. Believe it or not, these aids, such as Luminol, don't impact DNA testing, so they can be used on samples to detect potential blood. Please be aware that blood-based fluorescent chemicals are indeed presumptive measures, as there's a bevy of false reactions that can manifest and give off the presence of blood when in fact it's not really there. Things such as, believe it or not, cigarette smoke or ice melt for your sidewalks as we embrace winter and beyond can actually give a false result with these chemicals. Now, I want to spend then a few minutes to chat with you regarding how analysts go about processing items from a case knowledge standpoint, as how we go about looking at items and what we know comes with merits and challenges that can impact how long it might take to get your evidence results. Depending on the analyst, they may take different approaches to evaluating items from a case that helps them avoid falling prey to bias, such as, for example, contextual bias, where information pumped to them forces them to only look at an item for a given type of evidence. For example, if you say it's a sexual assault that occurred, the analyst might only then look for seminal evidence and not look for other corroborative evidence, such as maybe blood that was led on a shirt that they didn't evaluate sufficiently that would substantiate claims the victim was hit in the nose and it bled before they were sexually assaulted. Another good example is confirmation bias. This is where myself as the lab analyst might only look for evidence that would incriminate the suspect of interest for a case and avoid all known or detected alternative samples that refute this one or singular line of thinking. To avoid bias in our evidence processing that could lead to missed opportunities for discovering probative elements from an item, we use several different countermeasures when processing evidence. Let's cover, just for the sake of time, a few popular examples. Under the case manager model, managers will be fully informed about case context and where items might be inundated with potential biological evidence, while examiners are provided only basic information needed for the specific testing tasks they're asked to perform. They may know they need to look for a stain, in fact, and not much else. The case manager can then provide additional insight on an as-needed basis to avoid bias from creeping into the analyst's decision-making. Next, let's go ahead and talk about a blind examination. Some analysts totally avoid all details and go in devoid of case information, only looking for stains and processing them based on their training in visualization, serology, and DNA, without information that provides context to inform them about where to look or what to look for from a serological perspective. Lastly, some professionals use sequential unmasking. This is something that I've used, where they make certain key analytic judgments before being exposed to potentially biasing information from an investigator or other MDT members. In short, they might try to examine evidence and avoid case notes or contextual information until they hit a roadblock. They may only read a quick case synopsis and work from that before they then call an investigator or subject themselves to potentially biasing information. As you can see, there's then a spectrum to unmasking information with sequential analysis. I present all this information regarding how we avoid bias in our casework for a very important reason. You should care about how a scientist evaluates an item because this factor might just impact how long 
it takes to get your results. If they're going in blind with no information versus having an idea of the nature of the case, it could perhaps then take longer to process case items as an example. Let's go ahead and dig into the two phases of testing for body fluids that may occur then in a forensic biology unit. As I mentioned earlier, presumptive tests are just screening tests. Typically, they're color change based and can rapidly, and I'm talking within a few seconds to minutes, tell you if a sample is possibly a body fluid. Now, this informs us as to what we should do next with that item, such as take it on to DNA or stop working on it if no body fluid is detected. It's advantageous to do this sort of testing because the cost of the reagents to test the item is really minimal. It's just cents on the dollar, making an easy investment budgetarily speaking. Presumptive tests are typically highly sensitive, but they have a low specificity. What this means is from an advantage stance that we can detect very low level traces or dilute amounts of stains. But the tests themselves can be tripped up by other components and elicit false results, such as a false positive or false negative. In short, we may, in the case of a false positive, get a result that indicates a body fluid is present when actually it is not. Conversely, we could get a false negative for which the sample comes across as not having a body fluid. In fact, it indeed does possess serological material. For example, many different items, such as vegetable enzymes, have been demonstrated through research to potentially scramble a presumptive blood test, leading to a positive result when a body fluid actually isn't present. Because of false positives and negatives in our presumptive testing, we cannot definitively say a given stain is a particular body fluid at this point, and we need to confirm the stain in a second round of serology-based testing. Let's talk about, then, other challenges with presumptive tests. Other concerns are that presumptive tests do require consumption of some of the sample, so you need a sufficient amount to test and plenty left behind in case you need to run DNA on the item. You also can't run DNA on an item that's been tested with these chemicals. It does, in essence, consume the sample because the chemical reaction from the test renders the small sample processed unusable for other tests, including DNA. Thus, your discretion as an analyst again comes into play with serological testing. Do you test for a body fluid if it means less sample for a confirmatory test or even DNA testing? Sometimes, then, as I mentioned earlier, it's best to just forego serological testing and go straight to DNA. Again, I'd rather learn about whose DNA is derived from a sample than to know that it's blood or some other body fluid, but never get a DNA profile to correlate to an individual in our case. Moving on, let's talk about then confirmatory tests. If we have a positive result from a presumptive test, assuming we have plenty of sample to run the gamut of body fluid tests, that is, we will engage in a confirmatory test whenever possible. Note that some body fluids do not have confirmatory tests available to them. As the name indicates, these tests simply verify the presence of a body fluid or tissue. Confirmatory tests have a lower risk of false positives and are very specific for a given body fluid target, making them an ideal follow-up for homing in on what body fluids you're dealing with on a given item. Confirming a body fluid is great for you as the MDT member or prosecutor because it can give you that informative detail as to what body fluid was present, helping give a better understanding of a given crime or context to a piece of evidence while at the same time allowing the analyst to feel confident on processing that item, processing that item, excuse me, for DNA from that stain. For example, knowing and being able to say that a stain is semen versus only being able to say that it's possibly semen from a presumptive test can make a world of difference in substantiating your case of, as an example, child sexual abuse. The potential concern with these tests is that they can take several minutes to complete and require additional equipment oftentimes or different components. Now that shouldn't be an issue, but I do know that budget limitations are not foreign to crime labs. So this could be a possible challenge for your laboratory. They also require more sample to consume. As I mentioned earlier with the presumptive test, we're taking more and more sample away. So again, the analyst has to use their discretion to decide if they have enough sample to do this test or if they even want to do serological testing and just move forward straight to DNA with the item. At this point in the lab, I should have examined a given item extensively through visual observation. And as a result, I should have stains identified if they're present. Based on the physical appearance or ALS based evaluation of a given stain, I'll proceed with the most logical test for that item, serologically speaking. In terms of unaided or non ALS visualization, I'll have a good idea of what body fluid might be present just based on its physical appearance. For example, blood is typically dark red to brown or black. If I see that stain, I'm going to use my intuitive process to then take that stain and analyze it using blood-based serological testing measures. Now, semen may be dark and almost clear or translucent even, or it could just be crusty and yellowish or brown, depending on, again, the depositing surface, age, the amount and concentration, and so on. 
Saliva is kind of a mixed bag regarding interpretation visually. It can be clear, it could be a dark appearing stain, or it might be yellow. All you need to do to, to look at a saliva stain is perhaps to take your pillow out from under your pillowcase, if you need an example. You know, if the analyst is ever in doubt on a stain, they'll consider going straight to DNA. If there isn't enough material present to work with, in short, the stain is too dilute or too small, or if serological testing is simply not a pro priority for that item. You know, in contrast, the analyst may commence working with their investigative MDT and supervisor to unmask information to inform them as to how to best proceed if serological testing is absolutely necessary and the quantity and quality of the stain would allow for body fluid processing. Please note that today I'm mostly talking to you in terms of single body fluid stains. Mixed stains can be a completely different element altogether. And there might be different testing methods and procedures based on your laboratory's uh, standard operating procedures or SOPs. Uh, I will tell you that there's actually some work out there on how we can, in one fell swoop, actually analyze stains and determine multiple uh, stain sources in a mixed stain. But that's a discussion for another time. Most of that is embedded in research currently. So let's go ahead down the path of serology and start by looking at then blood. And then what we're going to do in the subsequent slides is look at the different testing measures serologically, our presumptive or confirmatory tests, if both or one or the other exist for each bodily fluid type. Looking at blood, the presumptive test widely used today is the phenolphthalein test. Now, some labs might also call this the Castle-Meyer test if my terminology is confusing to you. The reagent of the phenolphthalein test targets heme from hemoglobin in blood. Hemoglobin, just to take you back to your high school biology education, it's actually the oxygen binding component in red blood cells. Please note that heme is not exclusive to humans, so we cannot assume that blood detected is human blood. Thus, phenolphthalein tests for blood of any kind, and it doesn't tell us whose blood was let. It could be the suspect or victim or even an animal, for all we know, using this test. But at least in using this particular examination, we'll know if blood is possibly present or not. So we don't waste time looking at a stain that isn't probative for your case. Let's go ahead and talk a little bit about how this test is performed. The analyst will need a small amount of sample to test. And this can be acquired by taking a rubbing of a very concentrated stain using a sterile, that's a DNA or body fluid free paper. Alternatively, cuttings or scrapings could be used as well. Now, using that small subset of sample, the analyst adds a drop of the phenolphthalein and then a drop of hydrogen peroxide. If positive, in other words, if the sample is possibly blood, you're going to get a pink coloration as a result. I also want you to understand at a basic chemical level how the test works. Phenolphthalein and hydrogen peroxide are colorless before we use them on a stain. However, if heme is present, meaning that blood is potentially present in the sample, the heme will give electrons, and electrons are one of the three basic components of an atom, if you recall from basic chemistry, to the peroxide. To compensate, the blood takes electrons from the phenolphthalein chemical, which causes it to turn pink. Think of the reaction much like a molecular robbery, if you will. Instead of money being taken, energized atomic particles, called electrons, are stolen by the blood from the phenolphthalein, and it causes the chemical to turn pink. Much like in real life, how a person might blush with embarrassment or anger at the idea of being robbed. I want you to feel free to use this analogy or make your own better analogy when explaining complex forensic testing methods. The easier to explain a scientific concept, the better the triers of fact understand your methods and the results thereof, and the more confident they'll feel in the forensic evidence and your interpretation of it. There are many opportunities for other compounds, such as plant byproducts, to cause false positive reactions. Because then some plant components can effectively induce a false positive for phenolphthalein, coupled with the knowledge that this test doesn't tell us if the blood is human or not, we actually have to use a confirmatory test to make sure we are indeed looking at human blood. So there's a couple of potential pathways to confirm the presence of blood to make note of that you might see your laboratories utilize. Traditionally, we've used crystalline tests called the Takayama test. A positive result manifests when we see these red uh, up in the top right of your screen, uh, known as hemochromogen crystals that develop from a sample. To form the test, we take a small amount of stain, place it on a microscope slide, throw on a cover slip, a little glass uh, lid, if you will, on top of it. And then we add the Takayama chemical under it. Now, the pyridine chemical and the Takayama reagent, when the presence of heme and with a little bit of gentle heating. We just put the slide on a hot plate for about 30 seconds. It'll cause a chemical reaction where if blood's present, you'll get those red colored crystals. We have generally by and large laboratories have moved away from this confirmatory test for a few important reasons. Number one, Takayama chemicals are carcinogenic. 
cancer causing and it's just too dangerous to continue asking a lab analyst to, to use this method when other safer alternatives exist. Now, we used to have to confirm that blood was human beyond the Takayama test. We had to take it a step further and use what are known as antibody antigen tests. And I'll explain this type of test in a second. Now, those tests were not historically in their traditional use very reliable, and they were an extra time consuming step that delayed getting you your results. Since that time, most labs have invested in the HemeDirect test thing from Saratech. If your lab hasn't, I would highly encourage you to talk to them about this confirmatory test. HemeDirect is highly specific. It actually detects human blood, and you can actually get it to detect both injurious and menstrual blood. It's more selective and sensitive than Takayama. Best of all, I would argue we don't have analysts exposed to cancer causing agents. Now, HemeDirect uses principles from our own immune system. Basically, what we do is we inject an animal like a rabbit with human blood that acts as an antagonist or antigen to their immune system. And then we harvest the antibodies from that immune reaction. We throw them on a strip with a color change compound like the cartridge you see here before you. Our old method of antibody antigen testing then involved pitting antibodies against possible antigens, again, human blood in this case, in a Petri dish. And we had to wait for a whole day. Whereas the heme direct method only takes a few minutes. So if blood is applied to this testing cartridge, it'll turn colors akin to a pregnancy test with lines indicative of your final result, which you can see here. Let's go ahead and turn to another body fluid. All saliva testing is presumptive based, believe it or not. There's no confirmatory test that exists for saliva for a couple of reasons. First, the target enzyme, which is amylase, used in presumptive saliva testing is present in other human body fluids. It's made by other plants and animals. Second, a component of saliva, which is the buccal cells from our mouth, they're more forensically relevant since they contain DNA, as opposed to trying to determine saliva presence in most cases. After all, again, you'd rather have a DNA profile from the stain than determining if it's simply saliva or not. Now, saliva is basically amylase in water, so it's just not that specific as a body fluid in our system. So we can't get really detailed in its analysis at the moment, unless we consider novel or new methods. In fact, in my graduate research, we actually attempted to look at molecular markers like DNA or its sister molecular molecule that I referenced earlier, RNA, to confirm body fluids. But we're just not there yet in terms of these novel research methods. But I'm going to argue that one day we'll get there, especially with how fast DNA uh, methodologies are advancing. So how do we presumptively test for saliva then? Well, we start with a Petri dish like the one on your screen made of a sterile starch auger. Basically, auger is just a jelly, and we infuse starch inside of it. We mix it in there. And starch is nothing more than a complex carbohydrate or just a complex sugar. We then cut small wells or holes in the auger from our samples. Next, we're going to add those samples then to that plate. Now, we can take a small cutting in some nuclease-free, otherwise known as DNA-free water, directly to these wells. Or what we can do is we can actually add a cutting of a sample to some water, and we let it soak in that water to bring or slough off the body fluid off of the clothing or material or fabric on which it's deposited. Now, that liquid with the, the potential body fluid inside of it or the cells inside of it is known as an extract. So you can directly add the extract to each sample well too, but just know that an extract has the potential to dilute a stain since you're adding it to water to then pull the stain away from the material in which it was deposited. Now we incubate, in other words, we let each plate sit at 37 degrees Celsius. If you need to do the math, that's about 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit or body temperature. So it mimics the human body temperature for anywhere from 18 to 24 hours, we let this thing sit in that incubator. So again, we're trying to get the enzyme to, to act as it would in the human body. Typically leaving a sample in for the full 20 hours, 24 hours, excuse me, is better. So as to give the amylase the appropriate amount of time to do its work, to, to act in an enzymatic fashion. Now, what'll happen during that time is the sample diffuses and spreads into that jelly, that auger from its well. And if amylase is present, it'll react with the starch. See, if amylase is actually in your sample, it'll diffuse into that starch auger matrix and it hydrolyzes or breaks down starch into a simple sugar. Now, I always tell folks as an analogy that amylase is why M&Ms melt in your mouth and not in your hand. After 24 hours, we end up flooding that plate after the samples had time to, to permeate and pass into that auger with iodine. If amylase isn't present, that means the starch in the auger was not broken down. From a chemical structure standpoint, starch actually has large grooves in it. And so the iodine actually binds to those grooves and your auger turns a dark blue or purple color if amylase is not present. 
For a positive result, in other words, amylase is present, the well in the area around it where the sample diffuses will be made up of simple sugar. That's where the starch has been broken down or eaten or digested, if you will, by the amylase. Simple sugars lack those large grooves of the starch since it's been chewed up by the amylase, so the iodine's not going to bind to that area of the plate, leaving a positive sample to look like an unstained brown or yellowish zone. This test is called the starch iodine or radial diffusion test for amylase. Note that some labs may use a variant of this method known as the Fatibus method. Just very quickly to tell you about it, it's simply using this proprietary reagent. And when you incubate it with a sample suspect of amylase within 30 minutes uh, at 37 degrees Celsius in that incubator, you should get a positive reaction that's a shade of blue. Now, I'm just going to round off this slide by noting that labs typically don't test items used in such a way that saliva would be deposited. In other words, what I mean is things like a straw, a bottle, or so forth. We take that on straight to DNA. Since we can assume that DNA from any of those items is derived from the buccal cells in saliva, unless there's other bodily fluids forming or indicating that something different happened with those items. So just remember then, saliva itself doesn't contain DNA. It's actually the cells in the saliva from our mouths that possess this heritable material. All right, transitioning again, let's go ahead and discuss semen-based testing. Acid phosphatase or AP is an enzyme found several times higher in concentration in semen than other bodily fluids. Because it's so much higher in this fluid than any others, it gives off a very distinct reaction in this test method. They get the tried and true go-to target for preliminary seminal fluid testing. AP testing isn't confirmatory because, for example, it's also present in urine, feces, and vaginal secretions. So we need a confirmatory test to show up the results from a positive AP test. Let's go ahead and cover the AP testing process, starting with the presumptive AP test. You know, one to two drops of an alpha naphthal chemical solution are gonna be added to a sample or a sample extract. We're gonna wait around one minute and then add one to two drops of this fast blue or diazonium salt reagent. All this is carried out in a test tube typically, but I actually have seen and used in some of my classes, AP based wipes, if you will, that will run a sample. Once you run a sample across this surface, uh, just by rubbing it onto that testing strip, elicit a reaction. Let's talk about that reaction then. As you can see on your screen, then a positive result is a purple hue or coloration. Let's talk about how the test method works then. A water molecule is actually broken off of the alpha naphthol reagent by the AP, and it makes a new chemical called naphthol. Salt from the fast blue and the naphthol fuse together in the sample mixture and create that purple colored complex that forms if AP is present. Now, I wish AP testing results were this simple as you can see on your screen, but a lot of times they're not. Sometimes weak positives, uh, which is a pink coloration, have been known to occur with certain samples. Now, some analysts will call this a slight color change versus a true positive result. And some labs handle these differently. Personally, I would go ahead and test the samples with a confirmatory test since we can't rule out the presence of semen. But some labs have strict policies where they only process samples that have that purple coloration. And as such, any kind of slight color change results may not move forward with that lab. Now let's dialogue about some of the seminal material confirmatory tests. One major method used is microscopic sperm searches. As the name applies, we just search the spermatoz for spermatozoa or sperm under a microscope. Now we can't use traditional bright field lighting because sperm are so microscopic that they're near impossible to see in this format. Phase contrast lighting is used instead, as you can see here. This type of lighting requires a special lens to help slow the light down. What it does is it then bends and slows the light down as it passes through the slide with a sample on it. And it'll hit the sample in such a way so as to make normally transparent things appear visible to the naked eye. Now, what if your lab doesn't have the expensive phase contrast capabilities, right? Well, they could use what's known as a Christmas tree stain technique. And I think you can see, you know, for the sake of time, what happens here, right? And why we call it the Christmas tree stain. We have two differentiating or color contrasting stains, a red and a green one. And the green stain will actually bind to any cellular components without DNA, like the tail or flagellum of the sperm. Now the red stain binds to the part with DNA, that head and, and that acrosomal cap you can see, and I'll show you that in a minute. So what we end up getting is this red head and green body of the sperm that we can use for visualization. Let's go ahead and get back to those phase contrast results then. How do we confirm that we have, say, human sperm from a seminal fluid sample? Well, we examine a sample from an extract and we look at it in each field of view under a microscope for sperm across the whole slide if we're not using the Christmas tree stain. We look for human morphological or characteristic features of human sperm. 
When you tap on the slide, for example, believe it or not, the sperm will actually roll and they kind of take on the shape of little bowling pins. They typically have then, right, one long tail or flagellum, unless there's some kind of medical anomaly with the individual that deposited the sample. And they have a dark cap on top known as the acrosomal cap. Typically, three or more human sperm identified is sufficient to call a sample positive for human sperm and confirm the result. Let's move on and talk about then hair. Hair testing is a confirmatory type of test. In short, we can tell you if something is hair versus a fiber and if it's human or animal hair. Again, we use a microscope and we take a sample of suspected hair and examine its external and internal features using that equipment. I always liken as an analogy that hair is like a pencil and good analysts use some kind of similar analogy in court. You know, it has an external hardened surface called the cuticle an internal or kind of middle ground area that holds pigment for coloration called the cortex and an inner shaft that may be present. I say may be present. It could be absent in humans called the medulla. Thus, the cuticle is like the outer yellow part of the pencil while the pigment holding cortex is the wooden middle layer and the pencil lead itself if it's there is the medulla. We can use those three features alongside an evaluation of the root if it's present and the tip if we can see that to determine if we have a hair that's human or animal or if we have a fiber. What are some of the features then that we see if, if a hair is human, right? Well, the cuticle will have an imbricate pattern, which kind of looks like cracked paint on a house, in my opinion. The cortex will have an even color, pending that the individual did not frost or dye their hair, uh, within the length of the hair shaft. The coloration will typically be darker towards the cuticle or outer edges of the hair shaft, but redheads, for whatever reason, they can be an exception. Red hair has been shown to have darker coloration in some cases towards the medulla. I don't know the personal, the biological mechanism behind that, but if you have red hair, one of my daughters has, just consider yourself very unique. The medulla in humans is classified as either amorphous, meaning it kind of looks like a solid or broken line like pencil lead, or it can actually be totally absent, like a pencil with no lead. We also investigate how thick, if present, the medulla is by using what's known as the medullary index. A medullary index of equal to or less than a third of the shaft diameter, in other words, the medulla is pretty small, is indicative of human hair. In short, the medulla is very small inside of the hair shaft than of humans. And as I mentioned, we can also engage in additional examinations to help arrive at a conclusion for this type of evidence. You know, the, the root of a human hair is typically club-like in appearance, and oftentimes because we get haircuts, the tip of human hair might be cleanly cut or razor. Again, to reiterate, hair and fiber exams are not presumptive as there are definitive features that can allow us to determine if something is hair or fiber or if it's human or non-human if trained properly. Now, I can't tell you who a hair came from unless I get DNA. DNA can come from a couple of places right now. If we have a root with enough DNA, we might be able to pull a profile. If we get a follicular or skin tag, we could get a profile. There is some work out there in the research where people are digesting whole human hair and creating a DNA profile from the fragmented pieces of DNA in the hair shaft itself. But again, that's something for another discussion to talk about. I'll leave my contact information. You saw it at the beginning. I'll have that at the end. I can talk you through. I've done some presentations on, no, on novel uh, forensic methods. So they do exist, but nothing that's been uh, really consistently substantiated for our laboratories to use. So let's go ahead and, and give you a crash course in DNA then. At this point, if we're following through the, the course of a laboratory, you know, we have a body fluid sample that's been identified and we need to get DNA out of the cells from that body fluid they're in uh, for a profile. Now, if you access my first presentation in this three-part series, I do cover DNA analysis from a much more detailed overview. But for today, we're just covering this from kind of a very broad approach in a very fundamental fashion. So our first step in the DNA process is called extraction. Extraction is a process where we use harsh chemicals to rupture the cells and pull DNA out of them, simply put. We also have to remove other cellular debris like ruptured cell walls and proteins from the DNA so it doesn't interfere with profile generation. Now, there's a few typical methods for extraction. In organic extraction, we use harsh chemicals and rough action like stirring or shaking to rupture the cells open. We even use a variant form of organic extraction called differential extraction for cases where we believe sexual assault occurred. Basically, we can separate out the victim's uh, epithelial or skin cells and sperm cells based on its unique structure and then create the two different profiles from there instead of having to deal with a mixture, which some of you might know are a real pain to deal with. You know, there's also magnetic systems that can be used where DNA is lysed and then attached to magnetic beads that are then washed and the DNA is extracted. All this is done by an automated or robotic machine. 
So there's a little bit of trade-off here. Um, the trade-off for organic extraction is we can get a lot of DNA, huge amounts, but the chemicals are dangerous to humans and we might co-purify contaminants. It could cause downstream issues with getting a robust profile. Magnetic extraction typically results in much uh, less issues with contamination because we're doing all those washing steps, but we don't get as much DNA. So there's always that trade-off. Now, samples must often sit in what I call incubate. They've got to sit in that, that warm environment to ensure that the cells can rupture and that we maximize the DNA retrieved. So I'm going to be honest, extraction can take a few hours for a given sample. We often batch samples to then maximize how many we run at the same time to help save you time on the turnaround. All right, once our DNA chemistries, right, today they've gotten really sensitive. We've got to be careful with them, right? Today, we just need a little bit of DNA, a small amount of DNA to generate a very robust DNA profile. If we dip below the threshold amount of DNA needed to get a good profile, we can see certain spots of the DNA drop out and give us a partial or an incomplete profile. Conversely, if I use too much DNA, by contrast, we end up amplifying parts of the DNA we aren't targeting in our chemistries, or we just simply oversaturate our chemicals and use them all up in our our DNA kits, and that results in no DNA being copied for profile generation. And when we generate the profile, the amount of DNA too can also cause issues. It can cause excess light or signal buildup, and it basically blinds the DNA interpretation instrument, which can lead to, again, an unusable profile. Armed with this knowledge, let's go ahead and talk then about quantitation. All right, so quantitation is needed so we know the exact amount of DNA that we have in a sample. First, DNA has to go through what's known as polymerase chain reaction, or PCR. This is just a chemical process where we make new copies of DNA through a series of heating and cooling cycles called thermocycling. The DNA gets a light emitting or fluorescent tag on it. When new DNA is made, that light molecule is knocked off the DNA and it shines such that our instrument can detect it. You see the amplification plot at your bottom left. The more DNA we make, uh, the greater the fluorescence that we see with each reaction cycle then. Now, some Quantitation chemistry is also include a target, which is really nice, that allows you to measure if your DNA is degraded or contaminated. Now, it takes overall about an hour to an hour and a half to go from prepping the kit to processing these samples and getting results. Now, how do we know how much DNA we have then? Well, we simultaneously analyze known amounts of DNA with our sample and create a standard curve over there on your bottom right based on those known amounts and their fluorescence to determine how much DNA is in our forensic samples. So then we know if we need to dilute or concentrate it. Now, I do want to briefly talk about cleanup. Sometimes samples come in from a crime scene and they're just, they're not in good shape. You know, they're, they're mucked up with dirt and debris and we have to make sure that those elements don't get co-purified with the DNA as it could prevent us from getting good DNA profiles downstream. Many times if a lab is aware of contaminants, what they can do is they can try to actually mitigate those things. Some common methods that you here, centricep or microcons. Basically what they do is they filter the DNA through and they pull out the co-purified contaminants. They separate them. You know, Kelex, if you're looking at that, it's a sticky resin that binds to enzymes that might degrade DNA or destroy it. So what happens is you put this in a tube and basically what will happen is with, with high spinning is you pull the contaminants down to the bottom and it gets stuck in that resin and then it gets the DNA will be left in a liquid uh, layer above those contaminating elements and you can pull it out and extract it and it's purified. Now sample prep is variable. It just depends on really the methods that you're using here. Typically though, I can tell you if you let your laboratory analysts know ahead of time that you're gonna potentially have a contaminated item, they can go ahead and try to prep some of these things like the intercept columns. Those can be prepared overnight, which could save time for processing your samples and speed up the process. Moving on then, once we've got extraction, we've quanted our DNA, we need to go to amplification, where we make copies of DNA such that it can be used to develop that robust profile for statistical analysis and courtroom evaluation as it pertains to tying persons to a given evidentiary item. In other words, with forensic amplification kits, we basically activate a molecular copy machine to make multiple copies of DNA at several loci, all right, or specific spots of DNA and we tag them with light generating dice so we can tell all the different DNA pieces that we've made apart. For example, the PowerPlex Fusion 6C kit from Promega, that's the one that, that my lab used, will target 27 loci. It has huge variation in what the repetitive DNA sequences are present from person to person. Each locus then has great variation in the DNA sequence such that we, with enough different loci, create a highly distinguishing and very unique DNA profile that could be matched back to an individual. You see, each locus is made of alleles or specific flavors of DNA, which we inherit from our parents. 
These alleles are made up of different sequences of DNA that have repeating patterns called short tandem repeats. There are three to seven letters known as bases in length. Basically, we can detect what an allele a person has based on the length of their short tandem repeats. We need to make a lot of copies of DNA to ensure we can observe all the unique alleles and as a result, the overall profile for the evidentiary item. In fact, PCR is exponential or nearly so. So every cycle, we have a doubling of DNA being made. So if we start with two pieces of DNA, we get four pieces of DNA and then eight and 16 and so on. Thus, we analyze the uniqueness of a person's alleles for a given locus to generate stats for the overall DNA profile. And you use that information in court. Again, if you want to know more about this, refer to that first webinar that I put on. And I'm also available for one-on-one -on -one training about this subject beyond the recorded sessions. So the entire PCR process of thermal cycling and the heating and cooling to make new DNA copies really takes about an hour. And then it should take on average one to two hours based on how long it takes to get the samples prepped. The good news is that you can do dozens of these samples at once and batch multiple cases. So let's move on and talk about then capillary electrophoresis. This is kind of the final process in the lab as it involves DNA. It's used to generate our profile and see what pieces of DNA are present from the copy DNA we made in amplification. So what happens? Well, for starters, a laser excites the fluorescent tags on each piece of DNA and a camera detects all the DNA as it moves through a series of small capillary or plastic tubes and it gets detected. The fluorescent signal is converted into a computer image known as an electropherogram or a readable report of what alleles are present at a given locus for all loci tested within our kits. We know what alleles are present for a given locus because we run all samples with what's called an internal lane standard, or ILS, and an allelic ladder. The ILS is DNA of known sizes. It's used to assign sizes to the DNA fragments from your sample. An allelic ladder then is a series of known DNA pieces of a given size representing all the possible alleles for a locus being tested by our kit. Because the components of the allelic ladder and the sample fragments have the same length and the same sequence, they're going to migrate at the same distance at the same time in the CE. Thus, we use the allelic ladder to determine what alleles are present in your sample by comparing them to the known alleles from the ladder. In summary, then, we know the size of all the allele fragments thanks to the ILS, and we know what allele is present thanks to the allelic ladder. So we can then tell, based on size and fluorescence, what allele is present for a given locus for your DNA profile from the evidence. We then use rarity or frequency of a given allele to help generate the statistics used for your likelihood ratios and the like in court. As I mentioned on the last slide, the signal from the CE will be digitized into an electropherogram. A software program interprets the CE signals and generates the profile in this format. Once the program generates the electropherogram, there's still a lot of work to do. You have to review the electropherogram and determine that there, if there are artifacts from the CE process that need to be removed, which are not a part of the DNA profile. You have to evaluate as a whole if the profile is usable or if there's dropout or whole loci or allele issues that are present due to the quality of the DNA, the amount of DNA analyzed. You also need to know your lab's analytical and stochastic thresholds. Now, an analytical threshold is the lowest point at which a peak in the electropherogram can be deemed as an actual allele. A stochastic threshold is used to determine if a given locus should have two alleles, or is what we call heterozygous, and whether that second or sister allele will show up or if it might be subject to dropout because the DNA is of poor quality or the DNA amount was too low. Both analytical and stochastic thresholds are used to establish an increased confidence in the accuracy and quality of our electropherogram profile. We establish these thresholds through extensive validation studies, something I'll talk about in just a little bit. So your electropherogram can actually be used to tell if there's a possible mixture of two or more people. If there is, we can use software to help us deconvolute or separate out profiles from that item. We can only do this with so many people. Typically, your programs only look at deconvoluting two to four person mixtures. So there's going to be some limits. Now, once your profile is cleaned up, we can use a database of allele frequencies and calculate the rarity of a profile to then use statistically in a court of law. We'll then write up your report, which goes through two reviews. A technical review is executed to ensure the methods and measures used were logical, while an administrative review ensures the report itself is sound. All of these elements can take hours to days or even weeks to accomplish. Arguably, most of the analyst work will be devoted to this phase of evidence processing. Don't forget that it also takes time to scan everything in and out of our laboratory inventory management or limb systems to maintain chain of custody and allow you to retrieve your processed items. Very quickly, I do want to talk a little bit about additional workshop or excuse me, workflow considerations. Now, some labs, depending on their funding and processing demands and sample volume might utilize then 
automated systems, for example, robotic liquid handling stations to in mass process samples. Believe it or not, the laboratory inventory management systems I talked about, those limb systems can actually speed up and reduce backlog as well. They can speed up your, your case and your evidence processing. We actually used one where I worked. Um, we had RFID or barcode tags so that every time you, you scanned an item in or out, uh, we could track the chain of custody and it would autofill where it could. A lot of details in electronic uh, traceable forms instead of having to by hand fill out all of those documents. So we can alleviate a lot of hassle in our laboratories if we consider automation. I did just want to bring that up. So again, in conclusion, then the slide before you just shows the process uh, in each process along the way, once your items are brought to the lab and into our custody, you know, we could speed up the process by batching samples or, or going to automation, as I mentioned, but I really hope you realize that even one sample can take days to process alone. And that a larger case than with multiple items can require weeks or more before you get results. And that's assuming then no contamination or no mixtures, right? That these are just robust samples with great DNA and high amounts and so on. You also need to realize that analysts may be sharing workspace and equipment too. And if that's the case, it could take months in some cases for labs to get results turned around. All right, let's look at some, some engagement based learning here. Let's go ahead and, and test what have we learned, some of what we've learned. You know, you're the lab analyst in this case. You find this stain here before you on an item taken from a child sex abuse case. Assume you're going in using sequential examining techniques that we talked of at the beginning of the session, where you're only using just that basic information of the case type, and you know the stain features from our, our lecture today, right? And your knowledge of what stains look like to guide you. Take a moment in the chat, tell us what serological tests would you run on this item? What type of DNA extraction would you run? So go ahead and take a few moments and, and share some of your, your information. Take your best guess, there's no wrong answers. And as folks are typing, I just want to uh, remind people to please type to all panelists so that all panelists can yep. see your responses. Somebody said they test for blood and seminal material. I think that was Greg. Okay. Renee, saliva. Yeah, potentially. What kind of DNA extraction would we use? Somebody says feces, maybe. We don't actually have any tried and true tests for uh, fecal material, believe it or not. And feces is actually something alongside urine that many labs will not actually take because of the bacterial threshold. And because they also contain salt and other contaminants that might just render DNA irretrievable. Hair and fiber, potentially. I think we'd need a little bit more information, right? I think those are good examples especially from the serological standpoint. I know I'm asking you a lot with the DNA extraction, right? Just for the sake of time, we'll go ahead and kind of look at my thoughts on this. You know, if we're looking at, at my thoughts, the stain's kind of that yellowish or brownish color. I'm assuming, I'm assuming, you know, based on my visual observation, that looks like there might be some red specks in there too. You know, maybe the sexual assault resulted in physical damage and we have blood and semen deposited. So serologically speaking, I would definitely run with the phenolphthalein and heme direct to confirm at this point, I might go ahead. Someone mentioned saliva. I could do that. I think I would probably want a little bit more case information to see if I want to go ahead and, and run that too and see if amylase is present. There's so much sample here that, yeah, maybe if you, if you're informed of that and you want to go ahead and process that you could talk to your investigator and, and go ahead and maybe run that as a third test. So my reasoning is just kind of, it's really simple, right? I looking at this, you know, it's more informative to you as the prosecutor or investigator to show there was potentially blood indicating injury alongside the sexual deviance, which I would argue is shown by semen and then maybe even the saliva testing, as someone mentioned. Having both pieces of information, if they test out positive, will allow us to move on to DNA, and then that could be more informative than just testing for one body bodily fluid. So I like the idea of testing for blood and semen, just because, again, if the blood is from the victim and the semen is from the perpetrator, now you have this more well-rounded uh, observation regarding your case. I also feel confident in going through the serological tests and then doing DNA simply because there's a large amount of stain here and it looks pretty concentrated. If it was too dilute or I only had a little bit, I'd probably just go straight to DNA. 
Now, in terms of the DNA, right, I mentioned extraction. We went through that pretty quick, so it's okay if you weren't sure here and I didn't see any responses in the chat. You know, given that this is a sexual assault and given that I know with differential extraction, I can pull out semen and the victim's potential epithelial cells and create two different profiles, I'd go ahead and do that and try to make it easier uh, on the front end as opposed to finding out I have a mixture and trying to deconvolute it through back end steps. I think that that's just a much more informed way to do this. So good job. Let's go ahead and look at then a second hypothetical. All right. So let's assume in this case that that we do have some unmasked information as to inform us as to the nature of this sample, right? It's a sucker, clearly. In this expansion on our previous case from the last slide, the child discloses to a forensic interviewer that the perpetrator was licking a sucker at the time just before they were assaulted and that it fell out on the floor under the bed during the criminal act. Thanks to our forensic interviewers gaining that key information, our crime scene investigators retrieve and sure enough, a sucker in the location indicated through the child's forensic interview disclosure. Same thing goes, what sort of testing in the chat let us know you would perform on this item? Saliva, okay. Hair and saliva, yeah, you're noticing some of that trace element on there, right? Okay. Very nice. Somebody said go straight to DNA. All right, nice. Yeah, because remember, this is an item that we talked about where its use in and of itself would indicate potential saliva. So maybe we don't do saliva testing. Yeah, those, I mean, those are all great answers. And remember, there's no necessarily one wrong or right answer on this, right? A lot of this is our discretion. So again, let's let's peel into then my thoughts on this scenario. You know, the sucker stated to be in the mouth. It's an item that's known to be ingested orally if you use it in its traditional sense, right? And I know there can be some atypical ways people use these things. As such, I just go straight to DNA. I think it'd be ultimately a waste to test for saliva since it's evident it was allegedly used in this fashion based on the disclosure from the child and given our knowledge of how this item is traditionally consumed. You know, what about the trace evidence here? I go ahead and take a look at the different hair and fiber items and try to identify if anything was, was a human hair. I try to identify if it had a root or follicular tag since that could be another source of DNA to corroborate claims by the child and support the victim or the suspect being in the room from which the sucker was retrieved. Now, getting really detailed here, I'd number the amount of each hair and fiber type on the item since it looks like there might be two different distinct types. And I'd catalog them as sub items, but I'd probably hold off on testing them. Now here's my testing mindset. I'd store them and consider sending them on for trace if I didn't get DNA from the sucker itself. I also wouldn't take any possible human hair onto DNA at this point, if possible. Now, why is that? If I get the suspect DNA from the sucker, do I truly need to get the same profile from the hair if we identify it as human hair and if it has a root? The DNA from the sucker use tells us the same information regarding who is present. And you don't want to potentially burn through time and money unnecessarily by doubling up on profiles. Now, the greater in the greater scheme of things, you might do nothing with the sucker either. If the blood and seminal results from the previous analysis of other items in the case are more important to you. Now, this sucker is corroborative evidence, but it's really up to your discretion as if you really need both the sucker and the sexual assault evidence. Or if having both items might simply be too much for your jurors and could confound or otherwise muddle the case. All this under consideration and all this to say, right? Let's say that we do still send the suspect trace items on for testing. We confirm there's human hair present, but no root for DNA. Then we find out and confirm that the fibers from the sucker match the carpet and the sucker is in the victim's room. But does it tell us anything new in addition to or more probative than the DNA from the sucker itself? Or more powerful information than the results from the previous hypothetical evidence involving possibly blood and semen or maybe even that saliva. You know, through the fibers alone, you know, does it tell us the suspect did anything wrong? That's another thing to think about. So again, I present you all these hypotheticals and these questions, and I know your mind's probably spinning. Mine was when I first entered the forensic lab too, but I want these scenarios to, to get into your mind and to bounce around a little bit to get you to think about how dutifully and carefully we have to process every item you bring in. It can be really time consuming and laborious. On the flip side of this notion, I really want you to start thinking about what testing services you, you really need in your cases and what's the most probative analysis for these items to make sure that you're not getting duplicative results or confounding the triers of fact by over inundating them with information. All right, 
let's go ahead and shift our focus then to a discussion regarding how we know your results are of a high quality and provided through rigorous testing methods of value that are scientifically accepted. So we have quality assurance or QA. Now this is process driven and focuses on preventing any defects or issues in our testing procedures. And a good example of quality assurance in a forensic testing lab is the development, evaluation and dissemination of standard operating procedures. At labs where I worked, we had a constantly updated test method manual. Many labs actually publish these online for you to look at. And it shows, right, how to proceed about testing a given item. Now, a good QA program or policy, right, set forth also has analysts performing proficiency tests, typically quarterly in most cases, to make sure they're working at the intended level they need to be to be a great analyst in that lab. Quality control then is product driven, in this case, test result driven. And it focuses on identifying issues with a given sample or batch of samples being tested. So quality control really monitors and confirms the precision of the accuracy in our results. Some examples of good quality control testing, right? With, with positive and negative samples or controls, right? So samples that we know will turn because it's blood or that it shouldn't turn because there's we know there's no blood present on that negative control. All right, we have to document and maintain all QAQC elements for accreditation if your lab is accredited and to ensure that all lab items are processed according to the approved methods and within the constraints to which a lab can perform testing. If we don't do that, a lab can lose its accreditation. Evidence could be dismissed in court as a result. Analysts have faced jail time for misuse or violating and using unauthorized deviations from lab methods without approval. Right, so we really have to hone in on QAQC and that's something you should always look at with your testing labs or if you're choosing a new vendor. Now, there's a lot of other things that you can do in the laboratory to, to maintain a sense of quality control and quality assurance. Uh, just some of these very briefly, we were using personal protective equipment before COVID even hit. You always change gloves and masks uh, in between items. We always keep those on so we don't shed uh, our DNA onto items. Some other things that are really important to talk about here, ultraviolet light actually can, can be used to effectively sterilize some of our tools and our plastics that we use like tubes. Um, we use UV in our hoods. Again, what this does is it fuses the DNA together so that it can't be copied. And so we effectively remove that kind of contamination. You know, some other things to talk about, I really think we should talk about the, the pressure, the air pressure in our rooms. Um, specifically, Pre-PCR work like item exams, serology, and extraction should be done in an area with a slightly positive pressure where air is forced or pushed outwards. And what that does is it prevents the contaminated air that could have aerosolized DNA from drifting into the room and contaminating evidence. Know that other lab rooms and some equipment have negative pressure by contrast. So in a post-PCR room, that's after amplification or capillary electrophoresis during that. I want negative pressure to keep large quantities of that extra copy DNA from getting out to those areas and contaminating other pre-PCR samples. Some equipment actually incorporates airflow considerations like our fume hoods and our, our biosafety level cabinets too. So just keep that in mind. In terms of lab design, how a lab is constructed also helps control samples and protect against contamination. Now, these are just suggestions uh, for space per the National Institute of Standards and Technology or NIST. Not all labs have these exact spaces. For example, I've worked in a lab where evaluation of evidence could take place in a separate room, but usually we just did it on our bench tops. An extraction took place at my bench too, or in a fume hood. Any amplification took place in a hood in the same room, but it was away from the extraction area. All this to say, if you look at then the scientific working group for DNA analysis methods or SWIG dam guidelines, that's acceptable. Some labs are just not gonna have the space to, to have the adequate space and the equipment to do everything separately. So you have to make the lab space work for you and do your best to achieve some of these accommodations. And according to SWIGDAM, examinations, DNA extractions, and PCR by doing these activities in separate areas, in separate spaces, or at separate times. So we focused on separate times in our lab. We just wouldn't overlap with each other and we shared the space. What that meant was it took a little bit longer to get your results, but that still kept us in compliance and ensured that we were minimizing and mitigating any potential contamination. Now, typically some other things that you might see is dedicated space. We had all of our fridges and our freezers locked behind doors, and then they actually had locks on them themselves to minimize access and ensure chain of custody wasn't compromised. Little things like this, right? Having a separated CODIS workstation for your combined DNA index system. Having right separated vaults, we had a vault that was away from where the lab was processing evidence. All of these things are great for protecting your evidence and ensuring 
quality processing. Now, because we discussed the need for these different workspaces to separate out pre and post PCR so we don't wind up bringing in DNA and contaminating your items, I did want to show you what an ideal, if we had all the money in the world layout, looks like. Oop, I'm sorry. There we go, back to the lab. I wanted to show you what the lab looked like, and I wanted to show you some of the airflow considerations. Because I'm going to be honest, most of you probably have never stepped foot into the lab. And if you do, you probably had to submit your own DNA, right? Because there's no real reason for a, a multidisciplinary team member to actually be in that true processing area of the laboratory. It could throw chain of custody concerns into the mix with the, a savvy defense attorney. So for some of you, this might be your first time looking at what an ideal lab design looks like in terms of the airflow and in terms of the space that we need. So these labs, they're not cheap. The equipment is not cheap, right? It's very costly. Now, I want to give credit where credit is due. This is a lab diagram that's provided through the Forensic Technology Center of Excellence's Groping Sexual Assault Case Training. It's online and free to access, and it's the only source that I've seen that really provides a great example of what a compartmentalized lab looks like. So again, that we keep DNA aligned just to your sample that it's derived from, and we don't allow it to mix and mingle between samples, causing QAQC issues. All right, now on to this slide, right? I jumped the gun a little bit. So where do we get our quality standards? Well, you can see some of the organizations here, right? Our standards for what methods to use and best practices entail, including the lab space and the equipment considerations, those come from federally designated working groups with leaders in the field of forensics. Each forensic unit, in fact, has its own scientific area committee aggregated under the National Institute of Standards and Technologies Organization of Scientific Area Committees, or OSAC. Now, not included under OSAC, when we're talking about DNA and, and biological units then, is the previously mentioned SWIGDAM group. They met in 1988, and their goal from their first meeting was to bring scientists all around the world to validating forensic DNA methods and share protocols and best practices to establish guidelines for forensic laboratories. The forensic DNA community abided by the guidelines from SWIGDAM, and as a result, those guidelines became de facto standards that were recognized by courts as minimum requirements for a quality forensic DNA analysis program. Now, if your lab wants to set itself apart from other labs and demonstrate it's the best in the business, typically they go through a rigorous review process known as accreditation. You can do this through, for example, the, the premier forensic accrediting body is ANSI, and you go through their national accreditation board, ANAB. They accredit labs by auditing them and evaluating the facility to ensure their methods and all work products abide by international standards for forensic testing. There's two main standing, st excuse me, there's two main forensic testing standards, and you can see those listed just based on what your laboratory is, if it's a true forensic lab or if it's one tethered to a police laboratory. Now let's go ahead and talk really quickly about who's who in a forensic laboratory. And the reason I wanna talk about this, right? I mean, from your unit manager who oversees all of the, and again, a unit manager sees all of the units across all regional labs, all the way down to the technician, right? There is a hierarchy in your lab. So when you are concerned about how a testing method is used, or you wanna try something new and outside of the box, what you'll find is that your analyst is near the bottom of this hierarchical chain. You know, we examine evidence, process samples, and analyze results. We can't change we can't change policies on what can be submitted, and if we deviate from a testing uh, standard operating procedure, we have to get permission from the technical leader, who's the scientific brains of the operation. You know, they maintain the authority over all testing methods and procedures. So your unit manager takes care of all of the management of all of the regional labs in the units, right? Your technical leader looks at the scientific methods for a given unit. You then have maybe a supervisor that manages cases and can help from an experience standpoint, right? They've got years in the lab and they manage the other analysts. You also have the casework administrator for CODIS. Then you have us, the analysts that actually are doing the, the legwork and processing your items. And then finally, some labs, if they have the capability to hire them, have technicians that they do a lot of the QC stuff. They do our, our reagent checks. They check our controls. They'll do some serology, but then they leave some of the work of interpretation of the DNA and the, the more difficult nuanced processes to the analyst. So all this to say, if you're calling and, and you know, getting into a heated debate with your analyst, oftentimes they, they can't do anything. Their hands are tied. We don't make the methods. We just abide by them. We have to get special permissions and privileges from those folks higher on this food chain if we want to do anything outside of the box. So do keep that in mind when you're working with your forensic laboratory. You know, I do wanna talk about validation. I think it's a key component to the success of a forensic laboratory. 
And from, of all places, a criminal defense firm, I think they hit the nail on the head on validation. They state that legal practitioners are struggling to understand validation and how a forensic science technique qualifies as validated. I think that's totally true, right? Validation for reference refers to an individual proving that a given thing, like a piece of equipment or a chemistry or test method, is consistently reliable and able to produce the intended outcome for which it's used. Developmental validation, then, is the acquisition of test data and the determination of conditions and limitations of a newly developed method for analyzing samples. Basically, research and design companies do developmental validation and create the new equipment and methods that we use. Internal validation is something we do at the lab. Once we acquire a new tool or we decide to adopt a new testing method, we perform a battery of tests in the lab and create an abundance of testing data in the lab to demonstrate our methods and how far the laboratory can perform a given analysis and its success uh, thereof. So internal validation, every analyst should ideally be doing this in your labs. That is somebody basically testing and showing you what the forensic laboratory actually can do. Now, there is a circumstantial based preliminary validation that exists, but typically we use this only in cases where like a serious crime, like a bioterrorist event has occurred. And we need to get data and need to use results without having time to fully validate a method. So that's kind of that extreme circumstance type of validation. These tests are pretty exhaustive and laborious. They're time consuming and they are costly, but this is great data that can showcase, right? Especially if you use internal validation that can showcase just how accurate and how high quality your forensic testing laboratory truly is. Now, wrapping up then the culminating event where you intersect with your lab and the results typically is gonna be in court. So some tips that I have, if I'm just giving you again a 30,000 foot view case, you know, example of, of how to get the best, you know, time and the best information from your analyst. Stay the course, stay on topic, don't get mucked down or mired in methodology. It can be complex and confusing and the average person quite simply doesn't have more than a cursory interest in the science behind the samples. You know, keep it concise, qualify the, in, the individual, get their, their information out there, what proficiency tests they've done, the validity of, of their background, keep it to the results, use those analogies that I used and keep it simple, about an eighth to 12th grade um, you know, educational level. Use those analogies. Talk about validation if you need to. Pare down that language. Don't over exaggerate or overstep. One of the things I think that's really important for you to do is take some time and prep with your analysts. They are trained on testimony and they can optimize what you want to talk about and what you don't want to talk about in your lab report and how to best highlight and state certain things. So rehearse the narrative path and make sure you don't step on an ethical or an inaccurate scientific landmine, if you will in your courtroom, where then it makes you look less than professional. So to conclude then, as we wrap up, the author of Fight Club and, and several other novels just had a moment of clarity, right? Whenever he stated that everything is a self-portrait, a diary, your whole drug's history, and a strain of your hair, your fingernails. Everything you do, right, if you read this quote, everything you do shows your hand. Everything we as humans do leaves a trace that forensic science can detect and shed light upon. Because our methods are so sensitive and the information gleaned from them so important, we have to be thoughtful and purposeful in our work. Hopefully today you have a better appreciation of just all of the preparation, the quality and the care that goes into everything from how we look at an item of evidence to how we build our labs and validate new methods to empower you as investigators to keep children safe and out of harm's way. With that being said, if you'd like to learn more about Zero Abuse Project's trainings, please access the following links. Note that I am available again for training on forensics and evidence handling alongside technical assistance as it pertains to biology-based forensic casework. This is my email information at this point. I think we can entertain a few questions. Thank you so much for attending. I appreciate your time. Great. Thank you so much, Tyler. We really appreciate your time. If Thank anybody you. has any questions, we have just a couple minutes. Um, you're welcome to type them into the chat box. While we're waiting for any questions coming in, I wanted to thank everybody for coming and let me know if you would like more information about Zero Abuse Project. Um, I will put the, um, you can see the web address here on the slide. As Tyler mentioned, you can reach out to Tyler directly for training and technical assistance. Um, and you can also join our mailing list where you can get more information about upcoming trainings. Just give it another moment to see if anyone has any questions. We don't have any submitted yet.
So you plenty of thank yous. Thank you all. I appreciate your your time and your energy and your efforts working those hypotheticals and just for attending and being here today. All right. Well, um, <clears throat> Tyler, it looks like we uh, don't have too many questions coming in, and uh, I know we're coming up on uh, time. And so uh, let's go ahead and, and wrap up. If you can um, help me by uh, just let's go through the last few slides here uh, for us to uh, go through. And of course, thank you for. Uh, bringing up your information there. Um, and just for our audience members and those who attended again, we thank you for uh, uh, attending a, a very uh, well um, informative uh, web event. And I see the thank yous coming in here. Um, the virtual applause are pouring in here, Tyler. <laughs> so everyone saying uh, thank you here. Fantastic. So, um, uh, just uh, when we wrap up, just really quickly, wanted to let folks know that you can contact Intact at the information on this slide if uh, you're interested in learning more about additional upcoming trainings or any additional resources. You can also check us out on uh, Facebook at OJJDP TTA or sign up for our listserv as well to receive more information too. And we can go to the next slide. Um, here, if you're looking to get in contact with the help desk, uh, learn more about the Juve Trust, where you learn about upcoming events that we have or any upcoming uh, items, all the contact information is on this slide. Uh, again, I will put up the uh, um, slides and other handouts uh, in a few minutes, but I just wanted to know that this, uh, let you all know that this is where you can get in contact with, again, OJJDP, access their website, sign up for their listserv, learn about upcoming events, or even get any assistance that you may may need uh, through their help desk. Next slide. Do you have a training or technical assistance need? Well, if so, we encourage you to please submit your uh, request via the OJJDP TTA 360 platform. It can be accessed at this URL. Next slide. Uh, just a re uh, reminder that you can access uh, this and many more webinars around juvenile justice and child victimization prevention at the uh, on our YouTube page, and you can contact OJJDP TTA Help Test to receive any supporting materials. Uh, next slide, please. And just a reminder, we do have a couple of other uh, webinars coming up at the very end of uh, the month here, uh, some with our colleagues with NDAA. We have a couple of solicitation webinars that will be occurring uh, where you can learn more about how to apply for different OJJDP uh, grant solicitation opportunities that have been recently released. Uh, next slide. And again, we have uh, uh, another solicitation opportunity coming up in the beginning of February here around mentoring programs uh, that you can learn more about through uh, OJJDP about this particular solicitation, as well as a webinar coming up for our colleagues with the National District Attorneys Association. Uh, next slide. And I think that may be it. Um, so Ty, I'm going to go ahead and take the presentation over for, oh, oh, actually, no, no, not yet. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, yes, last uh, items here, we do have uh, a, a web, another webinar coming up in the middle of February, uh, one again with our colleagues with NDAA and then also with our colleagues with street law where they'll be uh, getting into some intro level skills for juveniles uh, to learn about uh, law, accountability, civics, uh, things of that nature. Uh, I think that may be the last slide uh, there. Uh, yes, and then another solicitation webinar on the 11th for those who are interested in maybe applying to a solicitation around opioid crisis and drug uh, addiction and its effect on youth. All right, and that may be it. Uh, <laughs> yep, okay. Thank you very much for that help, Tyler, going through those last few slides My there. Pleasure. I'm going to go ahead and uh, take the uh, reins back here. And again, uh, a couple of things that I want to do for you all, because I did get several people that asked where the handouts were. And so if you all look on your screen now, what I'm doing is sharing a few items for you all to get access to. So please uh, go ahead and um, you should see a couple of files, uh, PDFs that are related to today's webinar that you can access and um, get in order to have these supplemental items that are indeed associated with the presentation that you just saw.
Uh, and then finally, while that's up, uh, one last poll question that I want to pull up here for uh, our audience um, just as an exit poll so that we can learn a little bit more uh, about everyone and specifically how they plan to apply uh, the information. So you'll see on your screen that a poll will come up and essentially all we want to do is just know how do you plan to apply the information that you learned in today's webinar. Uh, so for those who are remaining, feel free to take your take some time to fill this out. You can click on multiple options here. So this is a multiple select here where you are able to select multiple items uh, related to today's webinar. How do you plan to apply the information that you learned today? That being said, that'll bring us to the uh, the half uh, half hour, and I'll go ahead and leave this up for folks to uh, complete, including the, uh, the files there to access and then the poll to complete. So I'll go ahead and just leave this up for folks. Again, I want to thank everyone for joining uh, today's webinar. Have a wonderful afternoon. Take care.